You're listening to Leaders Unedited with Keo, a monthly podcast where your host and Keo CEO, Margaret Mansfield, sits down with inspiring leaders making waves in Australia and beyond. Welcome to another episode of Leaders Unedited. I'm your host, Margaret Mansfield, and with me today I have the founder, executive producer and creative director of Perth Symphony Orchestra, Bobby Webster. Welcome. Thank you. Lovely to have you as part of our series. It's great to be part of it. Although I shouldn't say that until I know what, what you're going to ask me, actually. <laughs> Nothing tricky. <laughs> um, so 11 years ago, you started Perth Symphony Orchestra and you were clearly a woman on a mission. Tell me a little bit about that mission and how it's endured for 11 years later. Well, it actually started 22 years ago okay. in my head when I got off the plane um, and, you know, landed in Western Australia and saw a huge need for a, a second symphony orchestra in the state. Um, loads of communities that would never buy a ticket to an orchestra existed, so we're never going to be touched by orchestral music and a huge exodus of musicians leaving the state. So anybody that I wanted to play with you know, there, there was literally no, no work. So, you know, it started a very, very long time ago. It took a long time to work out how to actually get it off the ground. But yes, the initial concert was quite extraordinary going, wow, it's here. But that was not the end point at all. Okay, I've done it. I've put a or second orchestra on a stage in Western Australia. Off we go. It was like, holy moly, how on earth do I go from here? And actually, I had a really clear picture in my mind of what the orchestra would do and where it would go. That's changed a lot. The core you know, reason for being to reach mm. communities where they live and give musicians work has never wavered. That remains a guiding principle and our strategy fits that. But how we've done it and what strategies we've used um, have changed a lot. That's been a real adventure of finding out how are we actually going to put that into motion. Mm. And that's a, a, a really interesting lesson in terms of the purpose and the mission has endured and remained constant, but how you've gone about achieving it changes over time. And that's something I think organisations sometimes struggle with. Look, yeah. I made assumptions that people all over the world will respond the same to a symphony orchestra. Yeah. And having grown up in the UK where every village has two choirs and some form of music ensemble and a guitar group and a marching silver band and that history just isn't mm. in Australia. So my assumption that everyone will like it as long as I can deliver it wasn't ringing true. So I absolutely had to adapt. Um, and I think it's very easy to set yourself on a purpose and just keep mm. grinding away at that without really listening to what the market's telling you and listening to what the reality is and doing the research, basically, looking mm. at the data saying, that bit's working, that bit isn't, why? And then adapting to modify mm. how we did it. So. The real hallmarks of a, an agile organisation, you had to be agile and nimble. And look, we were hugely lucky. I mean, gosh, you know, I started the company on my own. We only had three staff for a very long time. It's incredibly easy to go, we've got to change and adapt. Mm. So one of the things I wanted the orchestra to be was really relevant because mm. there is a perception that particularly symphony orchestras and other major art forms, ballet, opera, mm. are museum pieces, that we preserve the great ballets of the 1800s and perform them as Tchaikovsky would have wanted them or symphonies mm. are done how Brahms would have done it. And to be fair, that still a lot of that goes on. Um, whereas I was like, how do we make this really relevant and meaningful today? So it's a need and necessity mm. in, in human life. Um, and so f a, a great example of how we had to be agile was that we got a phone call from the ABC on Boxing Day saying, George Michael's passed away. Can you get some musicians in the studio tomorrow, six o'clock in the morning, to come and play some George Michael? And me being me, love, love a challenge, mm. and our musicians flipping amazing, ring them going, do you mind getting up at five o'clock and playing some careless whisper for string quartets on ABC radio tomorrow morning, which they did. By 10 o'clock in the morning, I think we'd had 10,000 views something like 900 mm. comments. Oh my God, how beautiful, when are you doing this? And I thought, we need to respond. People want to come and remember this man played by this beautiful sound mm. of a symphony orchestra, not a tribute band pop show, but something with gravitas. And that's always what a symphony mm. orchestra has done. So we created it and performed it. Like that was it, it went in the program. So, you know, we've, we've been really able, being a small team, being a new company, 
to be that dynamic. And that's something as we grow, I hope we can retain. Mm. That's always the challenge, mm. isn't it? You, with, you want to grow and you want to continue to be successful, but you still want to keep the spirit and essence of um, a small organisation and able to be responsive. That's, yes, I think a lot of organisations struggle with that. And culturally, we're in such a good place. What's that going to look like as we grow? Absolutely. Mm. But also making sure that any systems and processes that we're building, which we have to, we're starting mm. to articulate how we do things, how it's done can adapt and that you know should we need to stop and the whole company just do this because that's where the world has taken us mm. and for goodness sake covid showed us that within months we all needed to do something differently um and we thrived you know like i'm, I'm slightly embarrassed when people are god i bet the arts have been really badly hit during covid mm. i'm like no the border shut there was no competition we went mad and started doing stadium concerts and sold out everything so, I'm like, so you know we we yeah. had an absolute ball in in some i mean gosh don't get me wrong there were some you know obviously tough elements yes. too and the whole working from home thing but you know it just shows me that being agile means that you really can take really tough situations and find a way to make it advantageous mm. And I think it also showed that importance of connection, you know, people wanting to come together, feel something wonderful together, um, you know, have that connection, which now in organisations, you know, with people working from home and people working over the world, that connection seems to be just as important, but really hard to maintain. So I'm interested in, you know, your mission about music for everyone. And why do you think, why do you think that's important? <laughs> oh my goodness how yeah. to articulate yeah. why is music important yeah. um look music for everyone is simply that um when you have music in your life it is a richer life mm. it's full stop and actually everyone knows this we know that when the footy team mm. scores a goal you know on pitch and the music pumps it gives us that adrenaline lift it amplifies everything we feel so music you know, can take a very vanilla world and make it into a very rainbow world. Everything becomes much brighter and mm. more vivid. And actually there's a current study being done, which is saying that we all need 20 minutes of music in our lives a day because it will vastly improve anxiety levels, um, stress, you know, mindfulness, mm. all these kind of things. So um, yeah, for, for me, music is connection. It is inspiration. It is enrichment. Um, and it also just makes me feel human. You know, I mean, I love a good cry at a movie when the mm. right, when, particularly when the French horns and oboes, always going to be those instruments. If there's a stunning oboe solo in a movie, um, that's when I kind of feel that immense connection mm. to the story. It draws me in and makes me reflect on me. So I just think it's a hugely powerful force that's somehow, in a way, particularly classical music, being regarded as a privileged ticket on a Friday night as opposed to something that really should be in our lives every day because it, it provides a soundtrack mm. that will make our lives bigger and better. I agree. <laughs> and I think there's some lessons in there for leaders in the corporate world um, in terms of, you know, how do you use music or anything in the arts and bring that into the corporate world to help people connect? I'm, really interested in that aspect and how you might have done that even in mm -hmm. Perth Symphony Orchestra. You don't just have musicians, you have a whole bunch of people coming together to create good music. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh gosh, don't get me started on how transformational music in the workplace could potentially be. It's, I think, one of the greatest untapped resources mm. that leaders have at their disposal. You know, if, if you... The thing is we witness these things, but I don't think we quite understand how to adapt it into our mm. workplace. There is a reason a football team sings before it plays every single game. That moment to stop, connect, feel heart and soul and remember the purpose of what we're out to achieve today, again, amplified by the singing, by the music, leads to an extraordinary outcome or mm. can do um, and inspires the fans. So why on earth would you put any team together and ask them to go and deliver a an outstanding outcome without having asked them to connect through music first. Mm. When it's known globally that this is how it works. Um, you know, I just think there's, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg mm. in terms of where I see music sitting in the corporate workplace. And, you know, it's, it's quite remarkable, even the team in the Perth Symphony office, if one of us gets an instrument out for whatever reason, suddenly it's all vibrant, everyone joins in, you know, we have percussion instruments and things lying yes. around and everyone will just sort of join in so it's it's a hugely connective 
kind of thing. Mm. Um, but I think more and more, just like we've seen the need for the word culture and an understanding of what that is and structure um, around developing mm. a culture, we will see that with music and art in the workplace. Mm. I have no doubt in the next 20 years. It's the biggest untapped resource as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Watch the space. Mm. <laughs> now, you've got such energy and passion and, and you know, you started out, as you said, 22 years ago with this vision. How have you brought people along with you? Because one of the challenges of a leader always is to keep bringing people along so that they have the same level of enthusiasm as the person leading them? Always storytelling, hmm. always. From the first moment we set out, from the earliest concert, there was a story about just how immense our impact was. And when you share that story, um, instantly people are like, I want to be a part of that story or I want to feel something like that. So, you know, one of our early uh, Baroque music concerts that we did this gorgeous immersive food and candles and wine and music with an actor um, at Wesley Church in the city. And it was just sumptuous. And I bumped into a guy standing at the back, literally standing, leaning against one of the pillars. And I was like, are you sure you don't want to sit? He said, no, no, I, I need to be here. Just, just, I, I might have to go. And I thought he might have to go because of work or, turns out he'd been dragged along, wasn't into classical music at all, begrudgingly, he was a policeman. Um, and just thought he was going to hate it. So he wanted to be by the back so he could leave at the point that he got bored. It transpires that he bawled throughout the entire concert. He said, I spontaneously burst into tears that the music just resonated and hit me in a way that he said it was the most unexpected thing I've ever experienced. And yet I feel amazing. I feel dead. He said, I need to go home. And, you know, and the poor dude had obviously exhausted himself crying for an hour and a half, but um, just said that was profoundly life changing. Um, I mean, I've got so many of those stories mm. along the journey and people are like, really? I wonder if I could feel like that or maybe I've missed something before. Or, and I'm like, well, no one presents concerts quite like we do. And that's mm. because I've really worked hard to understand what people need today in their life mm. and how can I bring that to life? And so it's got to the point where people, you know, that phrase, oh, my God, you really had to have been there. And then there's that mm. FOMO, damn it, we didn't go, we better get a ticket to the next one. Um, and we have to keep delivering on that promise of exceptional, extraordinary experiences. Yes. But guess what? It's amazing music and we have brilliant musicians in WA. So yeah, staying on the purpose has been incredibly easy because that's never wavered, that music for everyone is a given and needs to happen and how can we facilitate that? But getting people to buy into it has been from sharing those kind of stories mm. that transformation can and does occur. Mm. Wonderful stories. And then last year, late last year, you made the step of actually appointing a CEO for Perth Symphony Orchestra, which your first CEO, um, which meant stepping away, stepping out, doing something differently. How did you prepare for that and change? Did you have to change something about your leadership? Gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, you, when it's been your show um, and I'm just, you know, I've always kind of led from the front. I'm charging forward. Come on, everyone. Come, you know, come with me. Mm. Um, I've, got the, I've got to get this thing done. And by the way, I'm going to do it bloody fast and you all need to keep up kind of thing. And, you know, reflecting back, I'm like, wow, you know, there were a lot of people that couldn't keep up or just needed a bit of me stepping back and supporting and helping. And I think stepping aside to bring in a new CEO, because my job role was just ridiculous. Mm. Um, you know, I sort of had about 20 job titles, um, was just such a profoundly important thing to come in and build that support, work with the team, help them. So I can go off and fly and come up with all my ideas, but someone is there supporting <laughs> the team and carrying them and helping them um, deliver my vision, basically mm. the artistic vision. Mm. And how has that transition been like for you? Per where does it sit with you personally? Look, I'm very blessed that we have a brilliant person as CEO. So Catherine Henwood has taken over and she's, I'm in awe of her, like very competent, very smart, very thoughtful. She's been hugely respectful. So hats off, you know, that she's mm. very consultative and makes sure that I don't feel that she's just whatever, which in some ways I'm very comfortable with her actually making new decisions. Mm. That's part of what I wanted was fresh ideas and new ways of doing things, it's really made me have to create space, understand that I'm not the only one with ideas anymore. And that is a good thing 
uh, so look, I, I've had to reflect a lot and um, I took a long service leave uh, pretty soon after Catherine started, which was the best thing mm. for me to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm no longer the, the leader of this company. Mm. Um, and also to give Catherine space to find her feet and grow. But it's taken a huge amount of self-discipline to rein myself in as someone who runs and has run freely. And what a privilege is that, you know, to, to have had that blissful, I can do it anything right now if I want to feeling um, and now you know I'm actually seeing though the immense benefits of this new structure for the company so um, that that in itself speaks volumes but yeah self-discipline has been mm. th the name of the game this year for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've taken another big step Bobby which is about announcing that you're leaving Perth Symphony Orchestra have. and um, leaving this 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 baby that you've nurtured and grown um how does what's next for you oh my goodness you know i feel i feel like i've sort of shoved a teenager off to university in a way that i can't care too much about what subject mm. they choose or you know where 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 sort of if they stay out late or who they date i'm just like you're your own person now and that's where the orchestra mm. had got to so i felt it was absolutely and you know with um, such a great new leader in place that I felt it was a really great opportunity for me, who's been synonymous with that orchestra. Whereas I think I'm more than that in a way. There are other strings to my bow. I mean, I've mm. worked in engineering, I've, I've worked in accounting, I've, you know, and I, I want to use this plethora of skills that I've accumulated and experienced. And it has been the most extraordinary learning experience, mm. this job more than a leading experience, it's been a learning experience to go and do something different. So look, I, I'm going part-time first before leaving to give me some space to explore who is Borby Webster after mm. Perth Symphony Orchestra. But I'm full of energy, full of ideas. Working out what not to do is probably gonna be the, the hardest thing because yeah. I always have so many things that I would love, love to explore. So um, I'm just very excited about what lies ahead. Mm. And what a legacy you've built. So you spoke earlier about learning and, and you've learned so much. Um, if you were now giving advice to potentially that Bobby 22 years ago who had that idea in her head of starting this, this company, what sort of advice would you give her? Don't do it. No, <laughs> no that's not what I'm supposed to say, is it? Um, I didn't really understand the model of not-for-profit versus for-profit because I simply believe that everything should set out to be as successful as it can be, regardless of where any earnings go to at the end of the day. Um, whereas there is definitely a mindset for not-for-profit, which is if you've got something in mind, go out there and fund it before you deliver it. Whereas I was I need to build it and they will come. I build a product, show you the product works, mm. let you try it and then you buy into it. I think I probably, um, the first thing would definitely be in that business model to say, um, ask for help a lot earlier, ask for support, get people engaged in the vision more than the product. That would have, I think, set me off on a different footing, got more mm. investment early mm. on. I didn't want to ask for investment until I'd built it. And that was crazy to build a company that needs 70 people on a stage, employed, paid, rehearsed, and all the gear, you know. So yeah. step one would definitely be to ask for more help. The second thing would absolutely be just stay true to that vision that um, there are different ways of getting there. And I think, you know, I did adapt, but it took me a while. You know, there are some things I could have done sooner. So, you know, it took me seven years of running the orchestra to finally bite the bullet and f not feel shame at asking a symphony orchestra to play Nirvana. Because in my world, that's almost, you know, that would be selling out, mm. at least for the traditionalists. I've now realized it's not remotely at all. It's simply adapting and responding and giving a whole new audience goosebumps as opposed to a traditional audience goosebumps because the Nirvana fans absolutely loved it. So, um, you know, I think I should have just been a little bit braver earlier to do what my instincts were telling mm. me to do and not worry about the fact that everyone from my industry might judge me as a result. Mm -hmm. Some great lessons there. 
Well, it's been such a delight speaking to you. And um, I was at that George Michael concert and that made me so happy. So I'm one of the many, you know, converted fans uh, of the Perth Symphony Orchestra. But you've built such an amazing legacy. So congratulations. And I can't wait to see what you come up with next. Thank you so much. I'm excited too.